how do you debug reactive streams? Do we need to block the stream to inspect any object? Well, not really. You have, there are ways in which you can do this. For example, if you're doing this for your own, like your development process, you can set breakpoints inside of these things. The only thing that I've had to do in the past is, is do something like this, right? So let me comment this out, All right? So let's say you have a, a this guy, this guy over here, right? Get rid of this. So you want to debug what happens over here, right? So you can set a breakpoint over here. Sometimes you're, you will, you will need to have more control. You have more lines. You can just put like a nesting here like this, add more lines of code here, and then you can set a breakpoint here. And when this method hits, it is going to break at that breakpoint and you can uh, pressure. So basically the idea is the, the method gets executed at a different point, but what the, the contents of each method is still very much uh, debuggable like you're normally used to. All right, due to back pressure now, the pattern changes from push to pull. No, my friend, it does not. And that's what I'm cautioning you. It is not the same as pulling. It is basically giving a hint to upstream to say, go a little bit easy, don't push too much, right? The, the, when the event happens, still in the control of the upstream, okay? So you notice here, immediately after I get the on next, right? Immediately after I print this, I say request. I say, give me one more, okay? So when this one received happened, immediately after that, I said, give me one more. Do I immediately get it back? No, it is still, it still takes time, right? Only after a second, which is what the delay that I had, only after a second, the next item comes. What this is doing is basically giving a clue saying, okay to push. It's not pull. It is an okay to push signal, okay? A pull signal means you're gonna get the value directly. This is an okay to push signal. So whatever is on top is gonna be like, okay, I got an okay to push signal, so I am going to push whenever I control, right? The, the, the sender is what's controlling when it's happening. So it is still a push, okay? This is just conveying the, the thing lower down the chain. The consumer is conveying the willingness or lack thereof of being pushed a value. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right. I think we did exercise five, didn't we? Yeah, we did exercise five. All right. Now, let's see here. Okay, I'm kind of doing a stop check of where we are. I think there are still a lot more material here. I have a feeling that it is. We are going to go the go to the bonus. Uh, session, right? Okay. All right. So we completed exercise five and uh, we looked at. Ah, okay. Which is this one. So we looked at blocking for the mono, right? The, the problem with blocking is that it may not return a value. Okay, so we looked at how there are three possible events that are emitted, right? You get an you get an event, you get a completion, and you get a error. All right, I'm going to answer the question. So how do we know how many requests can be handled by Flux in a REST API and how to handle back pressure in such cases? Okay, so when you're calling a REST API, more often than not, what you're looking for is a mono because you get a response from the API, which is one thing. And granted, you might have a streaming response, but unless you get the whole JSON object and parse it into an object, it's it's hard to get a flux from it, right? Most of the times it's just a mono, okay? So what you usually do is you wait for that thing. Back pressure isn't a problem when you're dealing with a mono because you just have one, right? There's no point in saying, okay, give me more or give me zero. It's like, if you want zero, don't call the mono. If you want one, you call the mono. If you want more, the mono isn't what you want, right? You want a flux. So there's no concept of a back pressure in the mono. But with the flux, it is important when you're getting a stream of data and you're, you're kind of waiting. So imagine every event that you handle you're doing some processing 
and putting something into the database. Okay, imagine that situation. Now, you have to protect for, you know, being overloaded. Because imagine something is just sending data, which is at a faster rate, right? A lot of requests, a lot of users coming in. It's being sent at a faster rate than you can handle it. Well, you run out of memory, you have a production outage, right? Something is going to break there. So you need some way of signaling up front saying, okay, wait, right? So what you can do is you can implement yourself code to detect how how much capacity you have, right? You can have some kind of a queue data structure where you're processing it yourself. And you can say, well, if the queue size is beyond a certain number, you're going to do a back pressure signal and say, I want a few less items, okay? That way, you're not going to run out of memory. The performance is going to be a little bit impacted, but still you can scale. And there are other ways in which you can have a load balancer up front which says, okay, this is having a slower back pressure. You can switch to something else and you can handle it a little upstream, right? So it's basically when you would be processing and you're handling the data yourself that you can can control the dial a little bit. If you're requesting one value at a time, but if we increase request of 20, for example, is there a possibility that the subscriber might miss processing an element because it requested more elements than it can process at the time? Do you have any examples? I wouldn't say it misses processing elements. What you might run out of is memory, okay? So you have, again, it depends on how this is, this is implemented, okay? Imagine a situation where the Flux is basically spawning a new thread for on next, right? Each time you get an you get an event, it's spawning a new thread. So you would hope that you don't have a lot of those threads running. Or when I say spawning a new thread, basically you're taking a thread from a thread pool, right? Not actually creating a new thread. So you might run out of threads in the thread pool if a lot of lot more are coming than you are able to handle. Okay. So imagine a restaurant scenario, right? You have a bunch of cooks who are processing something, right? Cooking something, processing something. Yeah. You have a bunch of cooks who are cooking something and you have a lot of customers, okay? So imagine if you were to just take all the orders and you're going to run out of cooks. However, you can kind of control the rate at the, at the entrance counter where the cooks are going to say, hey, hang on, we've got too many requests. We are still working on it. Go a little bit slow, okay? So the person who's handling the payment or taking the order can slow it down, okay? So that's kind of back pressure that's happening over here, right? Because what happens if you have too many people coming in and you're accepting all their orders, but well, you're going to have to hire more cooks to have them do at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to run out of memory in terms of how many orders you're saving because the cooks haven't gotten to it yet. Your list of pending orders is going to grow bigger and bigger and you're going to run out of space to write. So that's the analogy that I can give. You know what I mean? So it is about how you can control it. You could, of course, have a situation where you can have infinite cooks, right? Every time you get an order, you have code, which goes, hires a new cook and puts them in, in, the, in, in the kitchen to cook, in which case you don't have to worry about running up. So basically that's the idea. It's not about not handling the request, which is a problem. It's that you're going to have too much in progress in flight at the same time, and you can run out of memory. I'm going to answer this question as well, because it's related. So continuing the above question, is there a way we can drop it instead of going out of memory? Yeah. You can do that. If you're overwhelmed, you can always drop it. So here, you can say, if not overwhelmed, only then run this thing. Otherwise, don't. Okay, so you're controlling the processing this way. You're, you're kind of keeping track of, am I, do I need this or not? So basically what you're doing is, you receive the event, because unless you receive the event, you, you still have that thing there, right? This is going to get invoked no matter what. So it's already invoked. You can decide to work on it, or you can say, I'm not going to prepare food for this guy, okay? This order, I'm not going to make, which is totally fine. You're going to have, you have ways of handling like a, you know, a fallback mechanism as well. So for example, you can do something else, right? right? If, if you're overwhelmed, then you can do, you know, just a, hard-coded value or something like that. So that there's still something, and maybe something else is expecting this. So you can still handle it somehow in a less expensive way, but it is in your control. You can decide to do this, okay? Of course, there are other ways. I'm giving you a simple use case. There are other handling back pressure. I'm again, approaching this in an introductory manner, right? This is an introductory course after all. I'm gonna make sure 
you understand rather than give you all the various options and you be totally confused, right? I hope this makes sense. This is one way to manually control this.